Hi, Nick Grimes here, and in this rapid sequence presentation, I'm going to talk you through five strategies to maximize your opportunities to acquire skills at electrical intubation. Now, I'm going to start from the premise that patients have a right to have their airway secured away, if that's what's deemed necessary for safe and effective airway management. So it follows that departments have a duty to be able to provide the skills to perform electrical intubation. Now this can be done either through developing local, local expertise in your own practitioners or from having an electrical intubation service that brings practitioners with those skills into your department. But either way, the problem becomes how do the clinicians who are going to perform electrical intubation develop skills in what is in most places a relatively infrequently performed procedure. So I'm gonna outline five strategies. The first is to simply lower your threshold for performing electrical intubation. We, we tend to approach this as a last resort, something that we only do when we think nothing else will work. But maybe instead of looking for excuses not to perform electrical intubation, we should be looking for legitimate opportunities to perform it. Maybe instead of asking, do I really need to perform an awake intubation? we should instead be asking, why not a electrical intubation? Doing this creates a lot more opportunities to develop your skills so that you have them when you really need them. And it offers the patient the best possible care. Sure, the 165 kilo sleep apnea patient might be managed to sleep, intubated to sleep with ramping and a hyperangulated blade and apneic oxygenation. But by the same token, if everything ran, went horribly wrong, you could not look, really look back and no one's going to say you couldn't have seen that coming. So why not ATI? No one could argue with you performing ATI in a patient like that, and it's a win for everyone. And if you take this approach and, and just do, do more of them, pretty rapidly most of the barriers that we, there are to performing electrical intubation fall away. So these are things like lack of confidence, concerns about time pressure, concerns about patient discomfort, and even cultural concerns that your colleagues might perceive you to be overreacting. If you reset the bar, you rapidly acquire skills, your confidence goes up, it doesn't take you as long, you're able to do it without causing patient discomfort. And if you reset the bar at a, a departmental level, then that cultural problem um, disappears as well because this just becomes a patient we would normally do a electrical intubation in. The second strategy is to consider alternate devices. So in his featured presentation for SAS 2021, John Sackle says, ATI is a technique, not a device. And that's quite right. Performing electrical intubation doesn't mandate use of a flexible bronchoscope. And this is something that's emphasized in the Difficult Airway Society electrical intubation guidelines. Um, so you need to recognize that there's an opportunity to use an alternate device with which you might already have skills or which you need to acquire skills with so you can kill two birds with one stone or a device with it which it's easier to acquire the skill than acquiring skills with a flexible bronchoscope. So ATI can be performed with a whole range of devices, not just a flexible bron bronchoscope, but a video stilette, a video laryngoscope, even a direct laryngoscope. You can use a supergodic airway as a conduit or you can perform awake intubation by a front of neck, front of neck approach. And recognizing that all these options are available makes it much easier for every airway operator to become proficient in a, a, an, an awake intubation technique. So you can also use combinations of devices. Um, and a meta-analysis shows that multiple devices are clinically comparable for awake trachealer intubation in terms of safety and efficacy, and some of them are even faster than using a flexible bronchoscope. The third strategy is to take what I call a modular approach to learning the various components of the awake trachealer intubation. And this is what we're doing at where I work at Monash Medical Center. Um, the Difficult Airway Society guidelines divide the technique for awake tracheal intubation into four components. And this is a great framework, not only for practice, but also for learning, because there's often, often opportunities to practice each of these four components independently, rather than only wait for opportunities to perform awake tracheal intubation itself. So let's talk through each of these, these components. So oxygenate. So I like to use high flow nasal oxygen for awake tracheal intubations. It doesn't seem like much to learn to be able to, to about that, but if you know how to set up the device and titrate the flow so it is um, up slowly, so it is not so unpleasant for the patient, 
it's one less thing for you to feel uncomfortable about and it's one less thing that might put the patient off the whole experience. Topicalization. This is really the key to awake tracheal intubation and it can be practiced in a whole range of settings. So you can practice on bronchoscopy lists, gastroscopy lists, even in if another proceduralist is doing the endoscopic procedure and even if it's not performed awake, the topicalization can be an adjunct to sedation. And at Monash, we assign trainees to these lists just to learn to topicalize. Um, it's good repetition, they get to do a lot in a single afternoon and they feel more confident at the end of it. The sedation component of awake tracheal intubation often isn't necessary and it can be dangerous. And the important message is not to use sedation to compensate for poor topicalization. There's lots of different medications are used for awake tracheal intubation and the appropriateness of them depends on the context, clinician familiarity, the dose and the mode of administration. But we all in our clinical practice get opportunities to sedate for various procedures. And so it's important to take those opportunities to get a feel for those drugs and work out the best way to get a reliably awake cooperative patient, which is what you need for awake tracheal intubation. And when practicing the actual performance of awake tracheal intubation, remember that awake tracheal intubation doesn't imply using a single device. So again, awake tracheal intubation with a, video, a hyperangular video laryngoscope requires you to be able to use a hyperangulated video laryngoscope. So refine your skills with this on asleep patients. Hyperangulated video laryngoscopy is in my opinion a poor skill, so you should be aiming for proficiency at it anyway. Awake tracheal intubation through a supraglottic airway conduit is a grossly underrated technique. You topicalize the airway, place the supraglottic airway awake, and then use it as a conduit to convert to a tracheal tube before you induce unconsciousness in the patient. It's easy to learn, it's very well tolerated providing you get the topicalization right. And you don't even need to use it to learn to do the conversion with an Aintree catheter. You can place the, super, place the tube through the supraglottic airway and leave it in situ, uh, leave the supraglottic airway in situ until someone with the skills to do with the exchange, complete the exchange comes along, um, is available. It's a great awake technique for clinicians who don't have the opportunity to gain um, skill with a flexible bronchoscope, and it makes awake tracheal intubation really available to all clinicians. And to create the opportunities to practice this, you can run theatre lists where a sleep intubation via supraglottic airway is performed as the routine way of intubating patients. Um, obviously, you've got to do that with appropriate patient consent, but I think you can really tell them that you're using a a technique that maybe has even less risk than putting a rigid laryngoscope in the mouth. And then don't make these lists just available to anaesthetists. Invite clinicians from other departments, from the emergency department, from the intensive care, so they can gain the skill in intubating through a supraglottic airway. And they can learn the, the topicalization elsewhere and assemble those when they have a, have a, have a patient who needs an awake intubation. Even for awake tracheal intubation with a flexible bronchoscope, you don't have to actually wait for a clinical indica indication for awake tracheal intubation to arise to develop your skills. So there are benchtop dexterity trainers, there are anatomical trainers, and then there are more advanced high fidelity computer simulation devices like the AUSIM. And using these devices allows you to progressively develop your skills, really scaffold your learning, so that you're adept at manipulating the flexible bronchoscope before practicing on patients. And when you get to practice on patients, again, it doesn't have to be in the context of performing awake tracheal intubation. So there's lots of other opportunities. You can practice nasal endoscopy by rostering people to ENT clinics. You may get the opportunity just to in introduce the scope down to the cords on a bronchoscopy list before the respiratory physician takes over. Uh, then you can move on to performing a sleep intubation with the flexible bronchoscope. You can dedicate certain lists to this again and intubate, um, just routinely intubate, do a sleep fiber flexible bronchoscopic intubations in those patients. And again, consent the patients, but you're consenting them again for a gold class technique. And once again, with all of these things, inviting other clinicians to share in those opportunities. And that really leads on to the fourth strategy, which is collaboration. Interprofessional collaboration is crucial. So ENT clinics, bronchoscopy lists, going to the operating theatre, any situation where you can share the opportunities to, um, where you can have opportunities to perform parts of these procedures, share the expertise, share the opportunities. The fifth and final strategy is to write it down. 
So I find with infrequently practiced skills, without the daily repetition, it's easy to forget the lessons you learned from the last time you did it, maybe weeks or even months before, and harder to make those incremental gains in skills. But if you actively document what you learned, why you did it, what you plan to do next time, and then read it again before the, your next attempt, it stops you having to repeat the same mistakes. I have a living document for ATI that I still continually update with things I learn as I go to refine my ATI um, technique. So those are my five strategies to maximize your opportunities to acquire skills in a wake to feel intubation. I hope you found that useful. I look forward to seeing you at the SAS 21 live stream event on November 19th.